Hello and welcome. This is my wife, Mary, and I'm Ed. We are Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. We're excited that you're joining us today. We present or expound on a principle or belief related to the SDA Sabbath School quarterly each week. This is week five of the third quarter. All of our videos this quarter have dealt with the purpose of Christ's first coming. Today we will discuss materialism and how it is not only a cornerstone of the SDA movement, but its understanding is imperative for a correct investigation. Last week, we discussed how to stop sinning. We showed that the solution to sin is by understanding morality and the principles of truth and righteousness, and by making them an effective reality in our daily lives. We discussed that morality is outside of God, which is a shocking thing to consider, but after examination, it just makes sense. The law and morality can only be based on truth and reality. The truth is the source of God's power, and it is the source we can also access freely. The truth is all there is. Falsehood is immaterial and therefore does not exist and has no power in our lives unless we give it power, which is the epitome of foolishness for sure. The Apostle Paul tells us that loving the truth is the way to be saved. In 2 Thessalonians he says, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Jesus in the Gospel of John tells us the same thing, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In the book of Ephesians, we see how important the truth is in our war against evil. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So let's talk more about the truth then. How can we determine what is truth? Well, here in my left hand, I have a Bible, and in my right hand, I have a Quran. As you know, if you were born to Christian parents, you were going to have the bias that the Bible is the source of all truth. That is what many Christians are taught from childhood. Similarly, if you were born into a home with Muslim parents, you were going to have the tendency to believe that the Quran is the source of truth. Here we have a problem. Which one is right about God? Is God like Allah or Yahweh? Which version of heaven is correct? Who gets to go there? Who is Jesus? Was he the son of God? Was he crucified? Did he rise from the dead? Well, these two holy books say different things, and they have a lot in common as well. Can I say Jesus is the son of God because the Bible says so? A Muslim would say that the Quran says not to call Jesus the son of God. So which is true? Of course we can recognize that appealing to the authority of one's holy book is not going to settle the issue. As a matter of fact, Appealing to the Bible or the Quran is actually a logical fallacy called argument from authority. The world is never going to come to unity and faith if we base truth on a holy book as an authority, independent of reality. The 1611 King James Bible in use in Ellen White's day actually included the Apocrypha. Some people say King James only. Others are open to many translations. Interestingly, Ellen White said this about the Apocrypha. She said, I saw that the Apocrypha was the hidden book and that the wise of these last days should understand it. She said, I saw, which is a claim to inspiration by the Holy Spirit. So you can see evidence by the different Bible canons people have not unified even on the set of Holy Scriptures. At the end of the day, we're left with my canon versus your canon or my version versus your version. What needs to be investigated are the actual individual claims. Do they agree with material reality? Even claims to inspiration must be tested. Or how would we discern false prophets? The Bible says to test claims against the law. Isaiah 8.20 says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. But how do we know that the law is true? Do we have to test that too? Yes, we must test any moral law. Is something moral because it is written in stone by the finger of God? Or is something moral because... Well, it lines up with truth and material reality. Is lying wrong because God said so, or is it wrong because it has no reality? If I told you that sitting between us is President Trump, that would be a lie, because he is not sitting here with us, and therefore it has no basis in reality. It has no truth to it. It is immoral to lie because it goes against reality. That's all there is to it. So something is not necessarily moral because the Bible says it is moral, or because a society says it is moral either. Different societies have different views of morality. Even people within the same religion or society have different ideas of morality. 
Some societies eat animals we in America would never consider eating. Some think it's okay to eat pigs. Some are offended by the eating of pork. Some societies eat cows. Some societies would never eat a cow. Some people groups eat dogs. In America, that would probably land you in jail. Some religions consider it sinful to eat meat. Other religions include eating of meat to be part of their religious experience. Some religions don't eat meat only on certain days. Some religions have specific ways their meat must be slaughtered. Some religions have no guidelines at all on this. Some religions require fasting, some don't. Some religions allow women to be pastors or religious leaders. Other religions consider allowing women to pastor an offense to God. Sometimes people debate that even within the same denomination, wink, wink. By the way, both sides are finding support for their opposing positions in the same Bible. Is it moral to kill infidels? Is it moral to kill animals? Is it moral to abort pregnancies? How are we ever going to be all united and in one accord with this confused standard of morality, even within the same denomination or within the same local church? Most religions have tried to solve this problem with a creed, telling you what you are to believe. I hope you can see that by basing morality on a god, a holy book, a creed, or by the norms of a society will never unite us. I give the state of our world and even our churches today as Exhibit A. So you can see, understanding that morality is based on something outside of God is critical to unity, even unity in Christ. That basis is material reality, which is simply the truth. Do we know Christ rose from the dead because the Bible we pick says so, or the pastor says so, or because we have looked at the material evidence and based our belief on actual truth, facts derived from historical documents, cultural and social shifts, independent eyewitness accounts, and archaeological finds, just to name a few. Ellen White tells us this same principle. She points out the fallacy of appealing to authority here, among other fallacies, including the bandwagon fallacy. She says, those to whom the message of truth is spoken seldom ask, is it true? But by who is it advocated? Multitudes estimate it by the numbers who accept it. And the question is still asked, have any of the learned men or religious leaders believed? Men are no more favorable to real godliness now than in the days of Christ. They are just as intently seeking earthly good to the neglect of eternal riches. And it is not an argument against the truth that large numbers are not ready to accept it, or that it is not received by the world's great men, or even by the religious leaders. The following is an excerpt from our website, www.bdsda.com, under the FAQ tab, entitled, We Are Materialists. This is by Trent Wilde. By materialists, we do not mean that we are greedy for luxurious objects. In fact, we view such a mindset to be entirely contrary to right principle. No, we refer to philosophical materialism, the position that all things which exist are material and that supposed non-physical realities are not realities at all. Some also refer to this basic idea as physicalism or naturalism. Whatever one may call it, the idea stands in sharp contradistinction to nearly all religious thought. Most religions are founded upon the idea that there exists another realm apart from the physical, the realm of souls, spirits, angels, gods, heaven, hell, etc. We find evidence for such a realm to be entirely lacking. This is not to say, however, that we deny the existence of all the things which most people conceive of as inhabiting this realm. Rather, we observe that the nature of these things has been grossly misunderstood. The words used to describe these things have been misinterpreted to the point that the ideas which they call forth in the mind are so radically different from their originally intended meaning that they hardly relate. For example, modern folk most often understand the words spirit and spiritual to be inherently opposed to matter and physical, as though the words themselves mean non-physical. Conversely, the ancient usage of the word, or more accurately the parallel words in ancient languages, was always material. The de-physicalization of the meaning of these words for those of us in the modern Western world is just one of the effects of the influence of Greek philosophy upon Judaic religions. Originally, Judaism and Proto-Judaism was a physicalist faith in the strictest sense. So while we deny the existence of what many today think of when imagining spirit and the other words we have mentioned, we do not deny the existence of things to which the ancient words originally referred. In other words, we reject the immaterialistic ideas of the Greek philosophers, but accept the materialism of ancient Judaism. 
Ultimately, our materialist position, while informed by and in agreement with Hebrew scripture, is not dependent upon it. Rather, the truth of this position can be independently verified without requiring one to accept certain presuppositions. Let us explain. The claims of most religions depend on their sacred text. One of the problems which arise from this circumstance is that religious disputes can hardly ever be settled, for both parties view their scripture as the thing which defines truth, and therefore, so long as their sacred text says something, they conclude that it cannot possibly be wrong. But what happens when two religious persons have two different sacred texts, and both believe that their texts define the truth? Each one believes certain claims, and each has the same reason for their belief, that is, their scripture says so. Thus, both persons only have as much justification for their beliefs as does the other. If a third person is introduced who has no presupposition as to the truth of either of the claimed sacred writings, how would that person go about determining which, if any, is correct? He or she cannot simply assume one to be true or arbitrarily side with one or the other or choose by preference and expect to come to real knowledge. None of these methods are a reliable means of finding truth, as most all will candidly admit. Consequently, there must be something outside of and beyond all sacred texts and religions by which we can test all claims. Such a standard does exist and is actually quite easy to discern. We'll provide a brief example to demonstrate. Suppose a person claims to have a sibling. What determines whether their claim is true? Is it not the case that the material existence, or lack thereof, of such a sibling is what makes the difference? In other words, if they really do have a sibling in material reality, their claim is true. But if they have no sibling in material reality, their claim is false. An imaginary sibling won't do, will it? Countless other examples could be given to demonstrate this point, but the lesson they all teach is this. Claims which do not correspond to physical reality are, by definition, not true, while claims which do correspond to physical reality are, by definition, true. This shows us that physical, material reality is actually what determines truth. Any claimed non-physical reality, then, is by definition false. Thus, our conclusion is that material reality is the standard by which all claims can and must be tested. Also, that materialism must be true and immaterialism must be false. The implication of these conclusions are far too vast to expound upon here, but they impact literally every aspect of thought and belief, both in terms of the content of the beliefs themselves and in terms of the methods by which we form our beliefs. Thank you for staying with us through the entire video. We invite you to visit our website, www.bdsda.com, to learn more about who we are and, just as important, who we are not. Please join us each week as we will continue to offer new and interesting insights for your Sabbath School studies. God bless. Many blessings.